This is WCNY's The Capitol Press Room, and we're turning our attention to the state's Brownfield Cleanup Program, a two-decade-old effort to redevelop abandoned sites in New York where the use of the property is complicated by or even made impossible by the presence of certain contaminants, often from previous activities on the land like industrial operations. To discuss how state environmental regulators approach this issue and highlight a recently completed effort in central New York, we're joined by Patrick Foster, the Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Remediation and Materials Management at the State Department of Environmental Conservation. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Thank you, David. It's really great to be here. So the goal of the Brownfield Cleanup Program, according to the DEC website, is to encourage private sector cleanup brownfields, particularly in economically blighted communities, in order to be redeveloped. We're going to get to the encouragement process and what that consists of, as well as the remediation efforts. But for starters, what constitutes a brownfield? What is the criteria to qualify? Brownfields generally are areas where development has already taken place in the past, So the focus on brownfields for new development or redevelopment is because we don't want development to happen on greenfields. We're trying to stop sprawl in general. And And greenfields for the uninitiated is what, land that just hasn't been developed yet? Exactly. So you can think about a pristine forest, right? Or maybe farmland outside of an urban area. So in order to incentivize development in areas that have already been developed uh, or developed in the past, New York State passed the New York State Brownfield Cleanup Program law in 2003. These particular brownfields would be brownfields where there is contamination. That is the threshold for coming into the Brownfield Cleanup Program in New York. So in 2003, the first generation of the law was passed, and it was a very successful program. And the legislature has reviewed and revised and amended the law multiple times since that initial enactment in 2003. But what actually constitutes a site that would actually qualify for the Brownfield Credit Program? Is there something about the nature of the contamination or its former use that would make it eligible for this program? The Brownfield Cleanup Program is one of a number of remediation programs uh, at the Department of Environmental Conservation at DEC, Um, and it is our voluntary cleanup program, cleanup of contaminants, hazardous waste. So in order for a site to come into the Brownfield Cleanup Program, a party, uh, usually a developer who does not have any other ties to past contamination, will submit an application to DEC that will be reviewed. And that application must have information about the site that shows whether or not there is contamination there. And if our review of that application shows that there is contamination and some other legal hurdles are are covered and crossed in that application, um, things like access to the site, then that applicant can come into the program and start a remediation process. A remediation process at a site, whether under the Brownfield Cleanup Program or the State Superfund Program, for example, starts with investigation. So there's a fulsome investigation that is undertaken at a Brownfield Cleanup Program site. Uh, After that investigation is completed, that information is reviewed by the engineers and geologists at DEC. A feasibility study is developed. That study is looking at the feasibility of different types of remedial technologies that might be utilized at the site. So at every site where there's contamination, we're looking at possible removal of the contaminants. So excavation, digging things up. We're looking at possible treatment of that contamination. Mm -hmm. So if there's groundwater contamination, for example, you might want to pump out that water and treat that water and clean it and then put it back into the ground. There's also these sort of amazing newer technologies. Um, We sometimes refer to them as bugs, where we inject um, certain constituents into the ground and the bugs eat away at the chemical compounds in the soils. And sometimes containment is the most feasible and best option. So making sure that the contamination is 
solidified, not going anywhere, has a sort of final resting place there under the ground. Once all of those options are reviewed, um, then we're getting closer to a decision about what the actual remedy is going to be. Well, how do you settle any disagreements about what the remedy might be? Because I have to imagine if I'm coming in and I want to develop a site, I might say, we can do this quick and cheap with some XYZ solution, whereas I might be a neighbor of the site and I might want a very extensive cleanup and remediation effort. So how do you as you know, King Solomon split the difference? One of the basic incentives for developers wanting to come into the program is to make sure that there is a pathway to deal with the contamination, which will ultimately give them a release of environmental liability. And that's extremely important for financing. The other large incentive for developers are these tax credits um, for both the money that is spent for the remediation itself and then also for, in some cases, the actual development. So just to lay that as the sort of groundwork and the background mm -hmm. of the program. So when we get those reports from the party that is in the Brownfield Cleanup Program, we review those reports and we are bound by our regulations to review those and to choose the remedy that is most protective of human health and the environment, the most feasible um, remedy. And I bring up the tax credits in answering this question because there is uh, a lot of benefit for developers. And so in the Brownfield Cleanup Program, we don't often get a lot of pushback for expensive, for example, remedies. So, so you don't potentially end a project when you come out with your remediation course for the future. Someone says, well, that's just too much for me to do. You find that the incentives are enough for people to say, okay, that's, that's a lot, but the, the incentives are there and it's worth us to pursue. Yeah, that's right. So it is, it is a voluntary program, so an entity could um, drop out of the program. Mm -hmm. At the point where an entity would drop out of the program, um, we would have often a lot of information about the site. And so that site, if it is grossly contaminated, might move into another remedial program. So there's a lot of different incentives for folks to stay in the program. And you can see this in the numbers. We have, since the inception of the the program seen, I think, over 1,300 sites come into the program, and well over half of those have received what we call a certificate of completion, which means that they have finished their remedial project um, at the site, and they can move on with their development. Um, so it's been a really strong program over the past two decades to get a lot of sites cleaned up all across the state. And how do you determine what is the right incentive? Because I believe that has evolved and changed over the years. I was looking at a 2013 audit of the program, and it noted, at least at that point, that uh, you know, prices were capped at three times cleanup or six times cleanup costs uh, for uh, projects involved with manufacturing. A and I have to imagine there are some people who would argue well, maybe we could be offering a little less of an incentive and still get in engagement. So how do you find that sweet spot? So I think that's a really astute uh, observation. Thank uh, you. The program has changed, and the changes that have been made to it are largely about the incentives. So the second generation of the BCP law, um, which I believe was enacted in 2008, um, started by putting a cap on um, the amount of tax credits mm -hmm. that a developer could get. And that was a big change in the law. The legislature has, has looked at this law multiple times, and we're now, I think, in the fourth generation of the law. And each time, uh, the legislature has both recognized the success of the program and re-upped it, and also improved it and really focus those incentives. So the third generation of the law, for example, changed the way that tax credits could be gained for projects in New York City. And in the fourth generation of the law, the legislature really focused on incentivizing projects that align with New York State policy. So affordable housing projects, renewable energy projects, those types of projects are really benefited and incentivized more under the current version of the law. 
I'm sure the legislature will keep looking at the law and will refine it more over time. You mentioned the idea of trying to advance certain state priorities with the projects that are selected as part of the Brownfield program. And uh, earlier this spring, we had the announcement about the completion of a affordable and supportive housing development in Syracuse. Can you talk a little bit about that program and how it might be emblematic of the latest incarnation of the program? Over the last uh, year, the number of brownfield cleanup program sites, you know, keeps rolling in, uh, which is great because we get to clean up a lot of sites across the state. But the proportion of, uh, for example, affordable housing sites is, is growing, and that's really, really great news, I think. So one of those projects, as, as you notice, is the Moyer Carriage Lofts uh, site in Syracuse, and that's a it's a really cool project um, in Syracuse. Uh, an iconic building there, a uh, big industrial building that you can see from the highway that many people pass like every day on their way to work and back. And on the top of this big rectangular uh, industrial building with big windows, you see a two-story house in the middle of the roof. Two-story house with pitched roof, uh, some dormer windows, it just looks like a sort of you know neighborhood house, but stuck on top of a building. So it's a pretty iconic um, location. And it sat dormant for many, many, many years after the industrial activities were um, completed there. Um, and there was a lot of contamination at the site from those industrial activities. A lot of these uh, industries that operated throughout the state and the country had machinery that needed to be degreased, and the chemicals that were used to de degrease the machinery seeped into the soils and then off of the groundwater underneath these facilities and in the areas around them. The chemicals are volatile organic compounds, um, and they're chemicals that you know need to be cleaned up. So this site, um, like I said, lay fallow for many, many years uh, until a developer uh, brought it into the Brownfield Cleanup Program. And it's been a really successful project. It was a complex project. There was a lot of um, care taken to maintain the historic structure uh, that was there. Uh, the house on the roof got renovated, which was not us. We were dealing with the stuff in the soils. But now the project is going to provide, I think, 128 uh, affordable housing units um, right there in downtown Syracuse. So Projects like these, I think, are uh, ones that uh, likely the legislature looks at and when they're reviewing the law and um, has, has directed our, our agency through the law to, to support. Is the threshold for remediating a site like this different depending on how it's going to be used in the future? So if you're looking to have people living there, is that different than if it was going to have new commercial or industrial purposes? That's right. So the cleanup standards are based on um, what the current possible use um, is of the site. So a lot of that has to do with zoning. But there's contamination everywhere, um, sadly. Um, and so sometimes we are cleaning up parks. Sometimes we're cleaning up areas that are going to remain industrial. Sometimes uh, we're looking at places that have been rezoned um, and they're going to be residential. And so there are different standards um, that we have in our regulations for each of those different uses. And is the pace of the administration of the Brownfield Cleanup Program set by the amount of money that you can allocate in a given year for tax incentives? Or is it a product of your capacity at the DEC to oversee remediation efforts? There's a lot of factors that go into the pace of uh, a remediation project, whether it's in the Brownfield Cleanup Program or the Superfund Program, whether you're talking about a federal remediation or a state remediation. Um, these are things happening in the real world that have a lot of different components um, to them. Definitely, there's portions of it that are about just getting out and doing the work and how much work gets done. Sometimes there are surprises when you're out in the field. Um, those affect the schedule. 
a lot of the schedule is dependent on the developers. Uh, most often the developers want to go, 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 because um, they have money on the line. But we ensure that all of these projects proceed stepwise through the program. Uh, and there is a robust uh, review of all information, review of all remedial systems to make sure that they're functioning properly, um, and also public involvement. So at each step of the remediation process, at major milestones, uh, the public has an opportunity to also weigh in here. Well, we've been speaking with Patrick Foster. He is the Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Remediation and Materials Management at the State Department of Environmental Conservation. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.